Let's pray. Yes, Lord, we echo those words that we've just sung. We pray that you would speak to us through this word, the Bible, your infallible, inerrant word to us. Oh, Lord, we often know that our familiarity with it can make us hard-hearted towards it. Oh, Lord, we pray that you would break down that tendency we have just to screen out what you would say to us Lord, we pray that you would give us hearts that are ready to receive for you have good things for us you have lessons that we must learn things that we need to hear uh, so that we may learn so that we may teach others also and magnify the name of our lord jesus christ so as we hear of him hear from him may all things be to his glory as we ask it in his name. Amen. As I say, we're continuing our series, Trusting the Saviour, the Gospel According to Luke. And we finished in chapter five last time with Jesus just using some very simple logic as he has shown abundant mercy and compassion to those in need. The outcasts in society, the helpless, those who needed great forgiveness because they were great sinners. And the words that he speaks at the end of that section are spoken in the house of a tax collector by the name of Levi or Matthew. And he was receiving, uh, Jesus was receiving much criticism for associating with such people. They were surely outside of God's sphere of interest. They were unholy people they were sinners and jesus's logic is beautifully simple he answered verse 31 those who are well have no need of a physician but those who are sick i have not come to call the righteous but sinners to repentance simple logic but outrageous to those who considered themselves righteous and therefore had no need of someone like Jesus, had no need of, of such saving mercy, they thought. They measured their righteousness by appearances, by outward acts, by comparing themselves with others. And the things that they do did, and the things that they definitely didn't do, would mark them out as being those who were serious about God. And Jesus again and again is showing them that central to God's purposes, all through the Old Testament that they claim to love and to follow, the central theme would be the mercy and compassion of God. And those purposes are revealed in Christ in, in the things that he does. That outrage the religious people, the self-righteous people. They are outraged that he should spend time in the house feasting with tax collectors, the worst of the worst, as we saw last time. But Jesus is very clear that if they were to accuse him, well, you're setting aside God's holy requirements in the law by being involved with such people. Jesus is very clear that that's not the case. He is showing mercy and compassion, but never compromising God's righteous standards, rightly understood. These people loved to use the law to establish themselves a power base uh, and a following and to discredit others. And particularly those who rose up and perhaps got popular like Jesus. They think, well, they, they hold all the cards, we might say. They have the power to dismiss such an outrageous teacher. People may think he's very popular because of the things that he does and the things that he says, but we'll soon take him down a peg or two when we demonstrate that he's not in accordance with the traditions, not in accordance with the rules of God. So I've given the title for this morning, Law and Disorder, a play on words perhaps, but we see that actually in the uh, insistence of the Pharisees and the scribes and the religious leaders saying that they were the ones upholding the law, that they had missed the point. And rather than bringing an orderliness, they brought great disorder. And Jesus exposes that in his teaching. 
Well, they were the guys in charge and uh, came across this cartoon that I thought summarised what life must have been like. Here's the person standing watching somebody else with a, a big rod attached to the back of their trousers and a, a hoop up here. Keep going, higher, jump higher. You can do it, grab that ring. And that seemed to be the sort of the, the life of the Pharisees, I, implying that adhering to God's standards was just this impossible thing, living in God's kingdom. All you needed to do was keep trying harder. And yet, the, the harder you tried, it seemed to make no difference. So you were just in this spiral of defeat and frustration. But I didn't stop them using this approach to, uh, to dismiss Jesus and to keep people in their place. And as we heard the, the passage read there for us, we see the great wisdom of Jesus in dealing with these self-righteous people. His patience and his grace as he reveals the gospel, the kingdom good news, and how it fits with their preconceptions of what they thought God and his kingdom was all about. They misunderstood the law and they had misapplied the law and had missed the whole purpose of the law. So they seemed to be the religious people, but they had gone so far from it. They were so distorting God's truth that they were far from the kingdom and keeping many far from it. So just three phrases I'm going to pick out for this morning from the three different incidents that we've covered. Um, I would just say that the, the last of those, a man with a withered hand, was one that we looked at not very many months ago. So if you feel I haven't done very much uh, detail on that one, it's because we considered that account fairly recently. So hopefully it's familiar to us. But firstly, then, the old is good. Chapter 5, verses 33 to 39. So here they are. We're still in the, in the house of Levi, having the feast that uh, he's invited people to come and meet Jesus and hear some of the things he has to say. And there's a question about fasting while they're feasting. It's perhaps easier to talk about fasting when you're feasting than it is to actually practice it. And in those days, there was this established tradition of fasting to show that you mourn over your sin. Uh, to show that you were yearning for the presence of God. You would deny yourself basic necessities, such as food and water, for a period of time to express that dependence on God. Now, in the Old Testament law of Moses, the occasions upon which you were meant to fast were actually very limited. Very few times in the year, the people of Israel were told to do fasting. But it had become... In, by the time of Jesus, uh, a, a way of demonstrating, of measuring your sincerity. Were you really serious about God? And Jesus is very clear in his teaching into that context that actually fasting is a private matter between you and God. If, if you want to do it, then don't, don't let anybody else know it. But that wasn't the, that wasn't the way they operated. These Pharisees, they thought they were getting some credit by fasting, so they made sure everybody knew about it. They didn't have a T-shirt that said, please show respect, I am fasting. But if they had that opportunity to do it, I'm sure they would have worn one. They would make sure their faces showed that they still had the ash on their faces that was associated with times of fasting. It was obvious. And we know that from this discussion. They, the people at the feast, they know that the disciples of John the Baptist and the disciples of the Pharisees fasted. They knew that they fasted often because they saw them doing it, because they made a bit of a show of it. And Jesus' answer is, again, simple and beautiful. Fasting, longing for the presence of God, that's just not appropriate. When Jesus is here, God is present in the room, in the person of Jesus. And he comes as the bridegroom to gather in his bride, to heal her, to, 
to restore her, to deal with all of her imperfections by removing her sin and taking it upon herself. The bride, that picture of the church, the people of God. And that's the picture Jesus uses, isn't it? Going and fasting a, a wedding festival, a wedding feast, it's insulting. It's ridiculous. You don't do it. And those are the days that we're in. Sure enough, Jesus would be taken from them. And then the disciples would fast. I don't expect they felt much like eating in those days between the crucifixion and the resurrection. Such was their confusion and sorrow at what they had witnessed. The traumatic incidents of those days. The loss of, uh, they, they'd lost all. Jesus had not met their expectations. Even though he told them time and time again that this was to be the path he would take to bring in the kingdom of God, to lay down his life for sinners. No, but now the bridegroom is here. Jesus is here. It's a time for joy. And enjoying the presence of the one who has transformational grace. And he goes on to give them that parable that we're probably quite familiar with. Those old expressions of devotion that the tax collectors, the sinners, the feasters had noticed. You know, those people are really devoted to God. We can see that in their faces. They've obviously been fasting. They're really devoted. Jesus is saying that those old ways are no longer fit for purpose with respect to Christ's kingdom. He's brought in a new covenant. It's the gospel age. And these things just don't mix with what's gone before. In fact, if you stick to the old ways, they will be detrimental. They will spoil. There's the picture of the shirt. We're probably not so familiar with it, is it? Because if our shirt rips, uh, maybe we go and get a new one. If our shirt, shirt wears out. But in those days, clothes weren't so easily available. So if you had uh, an old garment and you wanted to sew a patch in, you had to make sure it was an old piece of cloth that had already stretched. A new piece would, would cause a rip and would ruin the patch and ruin the garment. And everything would be spoiled because you didn't match the two up. And then there's the example that he uses of the old wineskins. And leather skins would be used to store wine that was in everyday use. And wine is... A vibrant product, particularly when it's first mixed together and the yeast is working with the, the grapes and the acid, uh, sorry, the sugars from the grapes and the acid. Uh, it's brewing up nicely. It creates gas and, and all those things. Uh, and an old wine skin is all brittle and will burst. And you'll ruin the nice new wine and you'll ruin the wine skin. You have to match things up. The old and the new don't really mix. So these things he's saying... These old ways that you're thinking of about fasting, particularly here. And as you'll go on to talk about the, the Sabbath in that sense. They're obsolete and can be so harmful if they're not used in the right way. So we've got that. But then we've got this unique verse, verse 39, which I've taken the title from. Because you think, well, hold on a minute. You're saying the title is the old is good. But all the things you've just been saying is that the old doesn't really fit anymore. And Luke's account is the only one that includes this verse 39. No one, after drinking old wine, desires new, for he says the old is good. Is, is Jesus contradicting himself there? Clearly we believe not. So what is he saying? Is he speaking with irony towards the legalists? who love to have rules and regulations about the days of the week that you should fast and how long you should do it for and all the procedures you should go for. Uh, is, he, is he ironically saying they can see the power of the new that has come in, but they don't like it. And they say, well, stick with what's gone before. That's one explanation. But for, for me, that didn't really seem to fit because he's saying, well, no one who drinks old wine desires new. He seems to be giving a more general application than just ironically putting the spotlight back on the Pharisees and, and their like. 
and sometimes we have to make sure we understand Bible times. Uh, in our day, wine is a luxury product, um, and then it was much more of a necessity. You needed to mix your water, which often had many impurities in it and could be quite bad for your health. If you mix that with a little bit of the wine, that would help to cleanse it. So they drink, if you like, very weak wine by our standards, and that would keep you healthy. And indeed, Paul tells Timothy in one of his letters to take a little wine for his stomach's sake, not to abstain from wine, but because it would be harmful for his health, his gut health, probably. Old wine was quite a rare thing because when you had wine and you needed to use it on a regular basis to keep your, your system flushed through, to keep you from the impurities of the water, you, you would use up your wine every year probably. And also great as these little bottles of, of leather skins are, they, they did then let the air in after a while and wine and air are not best friends. Your wine will spoil very quickly uh, if you leave it exposed to the air. So maybe some rich people were able to keep back some of the wine and experience it at an older age, but it was not uh, a common thing. So what, what is Jesus saying here then? I think he's saying that there is real value in the old. The old that's been revealed from the beginning of time, of God's plans of salvation, that have been manifested through the times of Moses, the times of Abraham, the times of David. God's grace is this old vintage. And the kingdom that Christ brings in is in that line. The grace of God is very old and it's very good. And when you have faith to appreciate that vintage, in the light of Jesus Christ, then you know there's no going back. You've tasted that, uh, and that is just, just right. So, so the, the, the grace of God is more fully revealed in the new way of the kingdom of Christ. You can't contain this new power that is in Christ in those old expressions, those old ways. They're no longer helpful to express and to convey the power of the kingdom, the joy of the kingdom in Christ. And I wonder if there's a case in which you can imagine that if you're like the Pharisees, there they are holding on to the old bottle that contains the vintage. They're so protective over the law and they think this is, this is so wonderful, but they've never actually tasted it for themselves. They, they feel they're guardians of the old but they haven't experienced the grace of the old. They've been so busy keeping to an outward protectiveness that they don't really understand it. And certainly now Jesus brings in that full manifestation of the grace of God through him. They, they're just completely undone by it. So I think that's what Jesus is getting. I think he's saying, actually, what we've got here is something really valuable because God has been revealing it right from the beginning and we now have to find new ways of appreciating it as Jesus brings it to the poor and the needy those who who would think they were outside of God's purposes well there's a bottle of uh, old vintage wine um, the Romane Conti from 1945 apparently that's the most expensive bottle of wine $558,000. I wonder if anybody's actually drunk that yet. That would be a very special occasion if you spent half a million dollars on it. Vintage wine doesn't come cheap. But the vintage of the grace of God in the scriptures is without price, isn't it? To us. It's a priceless thing, but at such cost to heaven. For it can only be brought to us as Jesus gave up his life. What a precious, precious gift. But we must move on. We've got your taste buds salivating at the thought of a half a million dollar bottle of wine. Lord of the Sabbath, chapter 6, 
and verses 1 to 5. The disciples were following him along on the Sabbath day. They'd left everything behind him. And so it's necessary for them to use the food bank. The compassion of God was built into the daily practices of farmers. They would leave the edges of their fields and pathways uh, from being harvested. They would leave the crops there so that those who are poor, those who are in great need, could simply help themselves. It's not stealing. It's a food bank, effectively, such as the compassion of God. But uh, in the face of such compassion, meeting the need of hungry men, the Pharisees are on their back again. They have broken the law because they've been harvesting by picking the grains and then they've been threshing, which is uh, you know, when they were rubbing the, the corn to, to just get to the seeds that they wanted to eat. Those things are forbidden under the regulations of the Pharisees. Never mind that they're starving. I'm sure the Pharisees were not starving at this time, uh, but they issued this challenge. Why do your disciples do this? And Jesus issues a challenge back again concerning David. Uh, you can read the background story in 1 Samuel chapter 21. We won't look at it now. But David was on the run and he was in desperate need. And he overrode the, the principle of the holy bread that was given as a sign of God's grace and presence with the 12 tribes of Israel. Fresh bread would be brought out every Sabbath day and would be left and could then be consumed only by the priests. But the priest gives David and his men some of that bread to satisfy them in their life-threatening hunger. And scripture doesn't condemn them, doesn't condemn the great King David for his act. And the Pharisees wouldn't condemn either. And Jesus is saying, look, that's the whole point of these laws uh, was an expression of God's grace to meet human needs. God's law isn't brought in to bring harm and to, to deprive people of things. You mustn't do this and you mustn't do that, just as some sort of uh, niggly attitude of, of God. No, God was gracious in giving the law. He wanted people to enjoy God's ways and to thrive by faith that their sin could be atoned for and they could enjoy fellowship with their God. And the law pointed forward to all of these things. You didn't have fellowship with God because you'd done all the works. You had faith. And you demonstrated that by keeping the law, bringing the sacrifices in the Old Testament way, trusting that they pointed forward to something greater. And Jesus says, I then am the one who has authority to declare what is lawful on the Sabbath or not. He is the one who reveals the true purpose of the Sabbath that was God's good gift to his people. He could define what was an appropriate response because he's Lord of the Sabbath. I was very interested to note that this same incident is recorded for us in Matthew chapter 12. And uh, we had at the beginning the, the, the sign up showing the, the verses that come immediately before this account. Here's Jesus inviting commanding people, people who labour and are heavy laden under the burden of the regulations that the Pharisees had brought about, huge volumes of regulations about what was or was not permitted on a Sabbath day. They were making the Sabbath something to be endured rather than something to be enjoyed. And prior to that Jesus has given this lovely invitation this lovely command come to me if you're labor and if you labor and are heavy laden i will give you rest take my yoke upon you and learn from me for i am gentle and lowly in heart and you will find rest for your souls the sabbath regulations that the pharisees were appealing to were burdensome and allowed for no true rest did they physically rest because they were so busy twitching at the curtains to see what the neighbours were doing and so they could criticise them and judge them and at the end of the day physically exhausted? And being far from their creator, who they were supposed to be resting in, they had no spiritual rest either. We've seen in our Bible studies from Hebrews a couple of weeks ago, wasn't it? Hebrews chapter 4, 
uh, where the writer there is showing that God gave the Sabbath as a picture and the promised land as a picture of entering into the rest that God wants for us. Gospel rest. God ceases from his work and rested on the seventh day. So we too cease from that relationship with him based on our works. We're no longer striving to see if we can attain to God like that man trying to jump up and reach the unreachable hoop. We rest from that because we can rest in Christ's perfect and finished work on our behalf. Only in Christ's cleansing sacrifice, in his perfect works, can we truly find eternal rest. That's what the Sabbath is meant to speak to us. It's a good gift, but it become a huge barrier to enjoying God because of the Pharisees and their niggly attitude. And finally, to save life, chapter 6, 6 to 11, Jesus is deliberately, publicly healing this man on a Sabbath day. He could have left it to a more private place. He could have left it to another day. But he looks around at everyone in the synagogue who'd gathered and heard the things that he had to say, who could see that Jesus was being carefully watched by the scribes and Pharisees trying to find fault with him again. He looks at everyone. Every single person comes under the gaze of Jesus. What are you going to answer? Is it good? Is it right to do good? On the Sabbath? Or to do harm? To save life or to destroy it? Surely the answer is obvious. But nobody will speak it out. Did they not know? Or did they fear being judged by others for undermining the religious leaders? The other gospel accounts tell us that Jesus was angry because their silence revealed a hard-heartedness. The answer was obvious. Of course, the Sabbath was given to do good and to save life, the words that Jesus uses there that I've got in the title. Of course, it was obvious, but they would not give him the satisfaction of giving the answer. They would not allow themselves to speak these things. Good work is, of course, perfectly lawful and in keeping with God's good purposes on the Sabbath. But all it did was serve to set them against Jesus as they prefer to cling to their measurable uh, ideas. We can work out whether somebody's right with God by looking at them and seeing what they do and, and building ourselves up. It was all just a facade. There was no inner reality. There was no tasting of the grace of God. Their righteousness was empty. Indeed, Jesus uh, in the Accounts that are given for us in Matthew chapter 12, I referred to earlier in verse 7. If you had known what this means, I, God, desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless. You would miss the whole point of the scriptures that you claim to be upholding. And you're behaving as judge and jury when you have no authority or right to do that. Let's just draw this together then with some closing thoughts and challenges for us. Have we received the life saving work of Christ that recognises that all the good things that we think might recommend us to God, that make us a respectable and acceptable person with others and so therefore with God? There's nothing. Or as the Bible says that all our righteousnesses are like filthy rags how dare we parade ourselves before god in such a costume we come to god on the basis of what christ has done his perfect work his life-saving work and only that you receive that very humbling isn't it to acknowledge that there is no hope outside of christ people love to be Feel a sense that they're in charge, that their, their destiny is in their own hands. 
very humbly to acknowledge that only through Christ can we find the eternal life that we all crave deep down. And if you've known the life-saving work, do you now enter into a joyful, transformative rest? Sometimes we can think of rest as it, right, head for the armchair, nothing more to do. It's my day off. And there's a place for that physical rest that we do need. But the rest that God would have us enter into is transformative. Even as we serve and, and seek to do what God would have us to do every day of the week. So he transforms us by his grace. He brings joy into our hearts as we serve him and be about his business. There's many things that would try to disrupt that rest. Many things that would distract us from it. Many, many things that would say we are a more important priority than the rest that you can have in God and in serving him together with God's people. Are you jealously guarding that sense of purposeful, joyful, transformative rest in your life? Sadly, are you like those who went from that synagogue meeting, having heard the word of the scriptures, doubtless, having seen the power of God on display so clearly as this man with the withered hand, simply by the word of Jesus, he very cleverly doesn't touch the man. There's no work, visible, measurable work involved. He undermines the Pharisees completely. And yet that man, just by the word of Christ, can stretch out his hand. They've seen that. And yet how do they respond? With furious plotting. What are we going to do with him? How are we going to get rid of this man? He's undermining everything that we stand for. We're getting nowhere. And you know how the Gospels end. They are granted success to bring about God's purposes. That Jesus would indeed die for the sins of the people. Well, if you are in that position, can I urge you to turn from it? Seek the grace of God to stand against Christ, maybe not trying to kill him in that sense, but wanting him to be out of your life. You're in a very dangerous position and you're in a very sad position. Come to him. In all your toil, in all your turmoil, and find rest for your soul, life forevermore. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you that your grace that's been in place right from the beginning is so clearly manifested in Jesus, his words, his acts, his wisdom. And we pray that that grace too would be ministered to us through your word and through our time of fellowship that we have after we finished. Lord, we thank you that you, you care for us so deeply and provide for us so richly and in such a great variety. And we pray that we would make use of all the different means of grace that you give to us as we read your word, as, as we pray, as we share in fellowship and service together in the church community as we have the privilege of being sent into a lost world to show forth the love of our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, for so many of us in this room, we have experienced that love in that personal and transformative way, and we now rest fully in him. Lord, I pray that any who doubt, any who are convinced that life following Christ is, is dreary and not rewarding, Lord, show them a different way. Show them the glory of Christ, we pray, even through us. We pray for our friends and neighbours and colleagues that they would see in us something of the wonders of the grace that is in the Lord Jesus Christ. Just as they might hanker after a half a million dollar bottle of vintage wine, Lord, may they see us and hanker after the grace that by your spirit we are able to display in our lives. We thank you then for your word and for this time together as we bring our prayers in Jesus' name.